Good morning. I'm John Bradar. I'm the Vice President for National Programming here at WGBH. And um, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the fifth uh, annual Green Media Innovation Idea Lab made possible through generous support from the Candida Fund. Um, in the room today, we have WGBH's top editorial leaders and researchers. We have friends from the foundation world, board members from GBH and supporters, and a group of independent public media producers as well. And we thank all of you for taking the time to be with us. I'm, I'm telling you, it's so worth it. The Idea Lab is a day that we look forward to all year. To me, it's really one of the best days. It's a day where it's OK to be drunk on ideas, uh, lousy with ideas, to be in idea overload. Um, and you have to pardon me if I get overly enthusiastic about this uh, idea thing, because I think it's a rare thing these days uh, to, to commit an entire day to just ideas. And, um, and, I'm, and I'm kind of proud to say that this is the kind of thing that I love about working at GBH, is that um, we're able to kind of do this to convene a group like the group in this room and dedicate it all to ideas. So Idea Lab enables GBH's top editorial folks and our independent producer friends to pause from the grind and take time out to listen to a rich mix. You are that rich mix of thought leaders and doers, and then to kind of percolate these new ideas for public media stories. Early this year, our Frontline series, uh, they created a hashtag around a film based on Atul Gawande's book, Being Mortal. And it, you know, that book focused on end of life issues. The hashtag was, hashtag what matters most. And I think this, this you know, trenchant tagline applies far beyond that issue and maybe it's a useful way to think about stories, whether in investigative journalism, in history, in science, and how we think about the Idea Lab, a fantastic opportunity to, to kind of percolate on ideas. It's up to public media broadly and GBH more specifically. In fact, it's our job, really, to tell stories about the critical issues of our times to diverse audiences around this country. And the importance of engaging with people around the country who grapple with these issues every day is vital to our research. So as a part of that, I have to thank all of our speakers for journeying here to help us consider new story ideas and new ways to tell those stories. The theme for today, as you have probably read in your agenda, is a pivotal time for climate, stories of danger and opportunity. And I'd encourage you, as you're soaking it all in today, to keep that hashtag in the back of your mind. From time to time, ask what matters most. We hope you leave today enlightened and inspired after hearing about some possibly game-changing solutions. And to lead us through this, our moderator is veteran journalist Miles O'Brien of the PBS NewsHour, of Nova, of Frontline, and CNN. Miles. Take it away. I love, I love that idea, drunk with ideas. Uh, I've had a lot of drunken ideas myself, and those don't, when I wake up, they're usually not so great. But um, we will be giving you an idea breathalyzer when you leave to ensure you're safe to go home. So, but do enjoy this. We do, uh, this is one of the great things about not working in the world of cable TV news, where, where I spent about 17 years of my career. There's no time for ideas there. You just got to kind of get it done. And uh, sometimes at the end of the day, you go, what was that? Anyway, so this is a great opportunity. Let's enjoy it. Let's uh, nourish our brains and uh, talk about climate change. Uh, you read, this is um, great timing. We're about to have this um, very pivotal, pivotal meeting in Paris. And uh, you, you sort of get the sense that things have turned, that the, the world's nations are finally recognizing this, uh, including the United States and China and India. Uh, some of the big climate change uh, contributors. Uh, what does this mean? Can we stop climate change at that, that uh, number of two degrees Celsius that everybody talks about? Probably not. Uh, we're probably going to get into the three degree realm, which is kind of scary and maybe worse. Uh, it's kind of like turning around a, 
a battleship uh, only uh, a lot harder than that. And when you read reports, as I did this morning, that this is really an issue about uh, human health and poverty. This could mean 100 million people displaced and, and lurched into poverty in sub-Saharan Africa and the southern part of Asia. So uh, we have a moral obligation to take this head on, not only to try to limit carbon emissions, but to come up with ways to um, address the, the real world situation, which is no matter what we do, we are going to create uh, a huge numbers of climate refugees if we don't act quickly to mitigate the impacts of what's, what is inevitable right now. Um, one of the things that we, you know, I wish, I wish when you turned on the local news this was said more, but the, the local meteorologists seldom make the connection between the wild weather we get at times and how that might have some connection to climate change. Uh, it seems to me that, you know, when you look at the numbers in the U.S., and I think it's around 40 percent still, you know, don't even believe that humans have any impact on climate change, believe it or not. Um, one of the key ways we could, you know, change that is if, if in that routine weathercast every night there was a connection made between a Hurricane Patricia or a Katrina or whatever, uh, or, the, or the wildfires, and how climate change has some impact on all of that. That is seldom said often overlooked, and, and actually when you start talking to uh, a lot of these weather forecasters, interestingly, many of them are climate deniers. So, that which, so th there's a lot of ways that we as, as members of the media need to do a better job uh, communicating and connecting these dots, I think. And, um, you know, PBS is, is such a great place uh, for this. We have a lot of people here who are um, uh, instrumental in very important uh, programs that uh, are serious and are willing to tackle difficult uh, subjects that uh, frankly get avoided by uh, other networks, the commercial networks. And so I feel very privileged to be a part of this family and uh, I really feel very privileged to be taking all of your good ideas today. So we'll be taking notes very carefully and um, we promise we'll give you credit if we use your ideas. So we're gonna start off and let's, let's try to connect the dots a little bit as we begin. We'll talk about uh, the big picture on climate change and weather. And we have uh, three excellent people to do that. And by the way, we have you know, kudos to um, Linda Herrer and her team for putting together a great group of experts. This is, this is uh, going to be a treat to hear from everybody today. And the format will be this. We'll bring the three, the, in this case, the three panelists up. They'll talk for, I guess, about 20 minutes or less, uh, give their presentations. They'll sit down. And then at the end, we'll have about uh, 20 minutes to a half hour, depending on how that goes, uh, for Q&A uh, with all of us. So we can uh, come up with uh, some con concrete ways that we can tell this story, I think. Let's hope. So uh, on our first panel, we, um, I'm not going to do big, long introductions. It's all there right in front of you. Can, you can Google if you want to know further things about them. But the long introduction is just a waste of time, I think, because we know who these people are. But we are, uh, we're privileged to have Carrie Emanuel, uh, who is a professor at MIT and has done some absolutely uh, the cutting edge work connecting uh, cyclones and climate change. Heidi Cullen, who's the chief scientist at Climate Central, doing the best they can to I don't know if you've seen some of the images they bring out, you know, what Shanghai would look like with, what, four degrees, and it looks like Venice. You know, it's really, it's very uh, important that those kinds of visuals get in the mix, I think. And then Walid Abdelladi, who is uh, at the University of Colorado, uh, atmospheric scientist, and who uh, I got to know when he was the chief scientist at NASA. So without further ado, let's, uh, let's bring up Kerry and have him give his presentation. Kerry Emanuel, come to the stage. Welcome. Well, good morning. It's a great pleasure to be with you uh, today. Um, I've been asked to talk to you about um, wild weather, as Miles put it. Um, before I do that, though, I'd like to simply to say that um, I think that the word opportunity, which you saw up on the introductory side, is a very important word in this whole game. And I hope we have a chance today in some of the discussions to talk about the opportunity that I think we have that is largely presented to us by new technologies to to finally solve this problem. So, extreme weather and climate. I'm going to be talking to you specifically about some of the hazards that we see being affected by climate change, being careful to tell you what we think we know and also what we're pretty sure we don't know. And after uh, I talk, uh, Heidi Cullen will, will tell you something about the really fascinating and evolving field of attribution. How do we tell 
for given uh, weather events in the climate system, how can we tell whether in some sense they've been affected by climate? So perhaps the most obvious thing to start talking about is heat. We're warming up the climate and heat is a hazard uh, around the world. And um, this is uh, a graph which shows you a history in black of the global mean temperature uh, relative to some starting point in degree C, starting in the year 1900. And then the red is both a hindcast and a forward projection by a climate model of what the temperature does. And you see that the asterisk there, the black asterisk, 2003 was the big heat wave in Europe that killed many tens of thousands of people. And uh, this, simply, this chart simply illustrates the fact that as the world warms up in general, the instances of these extreme high temperatures increase. And one of the first things one notices when you change the mean of a chaotic system is the change in the frequency of the extremes. Now, um, humans have an amazing capability, on the other hand, of adapting to heat. And we even see this when we look at the seasonal cycle. Mortality from heat waves is much larger at the beginning of the summer than it is in midsummer when it's actually hotter. And because even on the time scale of a month or two, people adapt to that. On the other hand, there are limits to the degree to which we biologically can adapt to heat. And there is a quantity called the wet bulb temperature, which we use a lot in meteorology, which is a function of both the temperature and humidity. And it really is a measure of how you feel. It's literally the coldest temperature you can make an object by evaporating water off of it. And that includes our skin. We cannot survive wet bulb temperatures over 35 degrees C. That is, if we go outside stark naked on a day when the temperature, the wet bulb temperature is 36 degrees, uh, we cannot indefinitely survive that without going back in, in a place where it's cooler. What you see here is from a very recent paper, just came out a few weeks ago, suggesting that depending on uh, how much we warm up the planet, we can begin to see in certain parts of the world um, daily maximum wet bulb temperatures that exceed 35 degrees. So where you see purple on these maps, the left one is in the current climate, the middle one is toward the end of this century for a fairly modest emission scenario, and the right one is for something more like business as usual, carbon dioxide emissions at the end of the century. And you can see places like the Persian Gulf uh, really start to routinely get above this limit, and that can be problematic. We can't adapt to that. Now, one of the most robust findings of climate science uh, over the last few decades, and, and I have to tell you, this is not something you need supercomputers to tell you. It's a few lines of physics on a piece of paper, and you've got it. And that is that as you warm the climate, hydrological extremes become more extreme. They have to. That doesn't tell you where and when they will happen. By hydrological extremes, I mean floods, like you see in this uh, picture. Uh, blizzards, in certain places you actually get more snow in spite of it being warmer, and drought, all right? These are hydrological extremes. One of the seeming paradoxes of global warming is that one gets more rain and more drought. Rain occurs in heavier events that occur less frequently in general. And if you look at climate model projections, you see it's a story largely of the rich getting richer and the poor getting poorer. That is, where it's already rainy, it gets rainier. Where it's already dry, it gets drier. And this is a huge concern uh, for national security. Our own Defense Department ranks it up there with the very greatest national security threats because this is what causes food and water shortages, ultimately. And over the long history of civilization, food and water shortages often lead to armed conflict and huge pressures of immigration and so forth. So this is maybe the biggest deal about climate change. So rainfall intensity, uh, for those of you who know some physics, goes with something called the Clausius-Clapeyron equation. It goes up exponentially with temperature, doubling for every 10 degrees C. That's just the intensity of rain where it's raining. Uh, and as I just said, wet places get wetter, dry places get drier. There's this large potential effect on wood, uh, food and water supplies. Now, another uh, kind of severe weather event that we 
uh, have to deal with, particularly in the United States, but in a few other places of the world, are severe thunderstorms and attendant phenomena like tornadoes and hail. Hail does an enormous amount of damage to property and mostly to crops in many countries, Russia, the United States, Canada, and so forth. And uh, it doesn't get a lot of press, but it's a big problem in agriculture. Where do we stand on this? Well, we can state, as we have stated for other phenomena, that rainfall intensity goes up, and that is about the state of science on this problem. We don't really know how climate change will change the incidence of this kind of phenomena, lightning, hail, severe thunderstorms, tornadoes, and so forth. I'm quite sure it's knowable. I'm quite sure it's a problem that can be solved, but we haven't solved it yet. Nobody in my profession, I'm pretty sure, will stick their neck out and say there will be more of these kinds of storms or fewer. Right. So it's important to understand where that we have a lot of uh, problems left to solve, scientific problems left to solve. We're working on it. Now, I happen to work on hurricanes, and we know something a little bit more about those. There is, in particular, a um, thermodynamic, a theoretical, if you will, upper limit on hurricane wind speeds. And I'm showing you a chart of what that limit looks like in the current climate. This is the largest uh, wind speed you can have over the course of a year anywhere on the planet. And I'm sorry, the units are in uh, the scientific units of meters per second. If you want to get nautical miles per hour, if you like knots, you can double that and get very close. Okay. And the most severe hurricanes, like recently Patricia in the Pacific or Katrina in, in uh, 10 years ago in the Atlantic, get very close to this limit. Most storms do not for reasons which are pretty well understood. But it is nevertheless instructive. It's very easy to calculate this limit if you know the climate state, which means we can also calculate it from climate data and from climate models. So here is a uh, chart that shows how this speed limit has changed over the 30 years from 1980 to 2010. And this is not from a model, it's from uh, observations of the climate, although a model is used to assimilate those observations. And where you see red, you have an upward trend in the, in the uh, units or meters per second per decade. If you want to get knots, you would double that. What I want to point out to you is that some of the largest trends are in the subtropical Pacific, that is the part of the Pacific where the speed limit's already high in the deep tropics, say around the Philippines, there's a little bit of an upward tendency, but the largest upward tendencies are north of that, uh, near Japan, and in the southern hemisphere likewise in the subtropics. Now we actually understand why this is true, and what this really means is that we're seeing an expansion of the belts in the tropics that can support strong hurricanes rather than an increase uh, so much in places where there's already a high speed limit on hurricanes. Um, Hurricane Patricia, which just occurred a few weeks ago, was interesting. It had the highest surface winds reliably measured of any tropical cyclone on the planet. Now, that can be overinterpreted because, in fact, we measure reliably wind speeds in only a tiny fraction of the tropical cyclones on the planet. We're not doing a very good job measuring these storms. And that's a big problem for us. So it's a limited statistic when we say this is the most intense. It's the most intense among those that we, those small percentage that we measure well. It had the lowest pressure ever uh, measured in a hurricane in the Western Hemisphere. And um, the pressure dropped an astonishing 100 millibars in 24 hours. So it's also the most rapidly intensified hurricane ever observed in the Western hemisphere. Does that mean that this was caused by global warming? It's very, very hard to say. It is, on the other hand, consistent with what we expect to see more frequently as the climate warms. Um, over in the Indian Ocean, um, uh, last week we had Cyclone uh, Ch Chapala. I'm not actually sure how to pronounce that. It was the first uh, storm to make landfall of hurricane intensity in southern Yemen in at least 55 years. We don't actually have very good records in that part of the world. Remarkably, right now, uh, there is another storm, Meg, following a very similar track. You see the photograph on the right. That's actually two days old. Uh, it's already passed over a, a, 
a fairly large island in that part of the world and is probably right now or about now making landfall again in Yemen. So uh, what's happening there? This is, these are rare events. This is getting more to the point because it shows something more statistical and therefore more reliable climate trend. This upper chart shows the latitude in the northern hemisphere at which hurricanes reached their peak intensity over time. I'm sorry that the time scale got dropped, but I believe it's a 30-year period from about 1980 to 2010 thereabouts. And we see that the latitude at which the storms are peaking are moving, is moving further northward. The uh, bottom chart's the same thing for the southern hemisphere, and it's the same story. The latitude there is moving southward, again, away from the equator and toward the pole. This is a, a very robust satellite measured trend and is consistent with the fact that the thermodynamic limit for storms is increasing in the margins of the tropics and not in the deep tropics so much. So that's a, a worrying trend consistent with what our models have predicted. Globally, we expect uh, hurricane power to go up. This chart shows a projection by seven climate models, basically, um, whose median is given by the red curve of a measure of hurricane power globally. The shading shows the scatter among seven models. There's still a lot of uncertainty in this game, but the general projection is upward. We, we have sort of perfected a method of going from global down to local measures through something called downscaling. And since we're here in Boston, I thought I'd show you the results of that exercise for hurricanes passing within 150 kilometers of where we're sitting, basically, downscaled from five climate models. And so what's shown on here is a measure of frequency of storms called the return period, which is the average interval between events, which is shown on the left-hand axis. It's logarithmic. So it goes from one year all the way up to 10 million years. And then the, th this is by category of intensity from just uh, tropical storms all the way up to Cat 5. So the blue curve is for the climate of the late 20th century and the red curve is for the climate of the late 21st century under a business as usual emission scenario. The shading represents the scatter among the models that we use to do the downscaling. So it's a loose measure of uncertainty and you can see that uh, in today's climate, you would have to wait, um, what is it, 100,000 years to have a Cat 5 within 150 kilometers of Boston. It's not going to happen, okay? But in a warmer world, um, this might happen every few hundred years. And conversely, if you go to a Cat 4, um, it's a few hundred years in the present climate. It would drop down to a few decades in the future if these model projections have uh, any merit. This is the same thing, but for storm surge in Boston Harbor, okay? And this is not including the important effect the sea level as a, as a whole is going up, and I'll get to that in a minute. Again, the blue curve is the present climate, the red is the future. A storm surge of four meters is extremely unlikely in the current climate every few thousand years, but it may become as frequent as every few hundred years. And then if you go to a surge of two or three meters, of course, um, the fact that these curves hardly overlap shows that this is a robust result among the climate models. This is now taking into account one meter of sea level rise, which is not completely unrealistic for the end of the century. And now these curves become really separate. And a five meter surge is something you might expect to happen in Boston Harbor. That would really be catastrophic, by the way, for Boston, but that might happen every few hundred years, which is about the frequency of a kind of New England uh, 38 style hurricane. Um, rain is a big problem as we learned for example or we relearned with Hurricane Irene and rainfall is robustly by every method expected to go up in hurricane events. You can see the return period for heavy rains drops rather precipitously if you'll excuse the pun as we go into the future. So let me uh, summarize this so that we have uh, time later for questions. Um, I should have said this at the beginning, uh, I think you all realize the climate is warming, that's beyond dispute at this point, and it is warming largely because of an increase in greenhouse gases. Uh, in fact, some of the other things that drive climate, like solar flux, seem to be going the other way, if anything at all. 
much of the tangible risk, but by no means the only tangible risk of climate change is in the changing occurrence of extreme weather events. They're in some ways the canary in the mine for climate change. They're the thing you notice first. New York isn't suffering much from the fact directly that sea level is a foot higher than it was 100 years ago, but boy did it suffer from that indirectly when it had Hurricane Sandy. You put a surge on top of an elevated sea level, uh, you've got problems. Um, projections of climate change effects on weather extremes vary a great deal depending upon what weather event you're talking about and, of course, the models that are used to make those projections. Heat waves, not surprisingly, become more frequent and cold waves less so. The incidence of floods increases fairly rapidly in all of these projections and the incidence of drought also increases fairly rapidly and we're beginning to see signals of that now in, uh, in climate data. We don't know very much yet, although I think if I ever come back and talk to you in a few years, we probably will know a lot more about how climate change affects severe thunderstorms, hailstorms, tornadoes, and so forth. The frequency of intense um, destructive hurricanes is projected to increase. The frequency of low category hurricanes is not so well understood. In fact, most of us think, if anything, they will go down, but they typically don't do very much damage. Hurricane related flooding um, is exacerbated by rising sea level. And at least in some places like New England, we expect to see an increased incident of very strong storms and enhanced rainfall. So I will leave you with that and we'll go on to the next presentation, I guess. speed limit for hurricanes, and it's going up, is there like a, a sound barrier for hurricanes? Uh, you know, is there a certain place at which they can't get faster, or can that just keep growing? No, they can't, they can't grow without bound, mm -hmm. uh, but they can get a whole lot more intense than we're projecting them to. So we're not near the ultimate limit. There is an ultimate limit. What is it? Oh, it's, it's up there in the sort of four or 500 mile per hour range. Oh, <laughs> we're not, okay. We're not going to get there. Anymore. Okay. I hope we're not all right, I'm glad to hear that. Thank <laughs> you, Kerry. Wow, scary stuff. Uh, all right, uh, our next uh, speaker was, uh, I think she's the, maybe the first and only climate forecaster on television. Is that right? I mean, no, one, no one's ever done that. But before, yeah, first and last, I, I don't know what happened with the Weather Channel. They moved on, I guess. They, they were green for about 10 minutes, I think, you know. Literally, they turn green. Uh, Heidi Cullen, come to the stage. Thank you. Um, thank you to Linda for inviting me. Thanks to Miles for moderating. Um, and Paula, I look forward to meeting you. And I'll just start by saying that actually I became a I became a scientist because of, of stories and, and watching shows like Nova as a kid growing up on Staten Island with two parents who never went to college. So I truly fundamentally believe in the power of storytelling because it, it can really, really change lives. So, you know, my, my hopeful contribution to the discussion of ideas today is to, to walk you through a little bit um, about what is, I think, really kind of a cutting edge of science right now. It's called extreme event attribution. Um, and what I figured I would do is kind of give you a little bit of the history. And then, you know, I, I, you know, as Miles said, I spent some time on the Weather Channel. And, you know, Miles, I will say that one of the things that we did do when I um, left the Weather Channel to help start up this nonprofit called Climate Central is we started working with local TV meteorologists. Because if I learned anything at the Weather Channel, it was that local TV is critical and no one ever talked about climate change. And so at this point, we've actually got about 300 local TV meteorologists that we give weekly climate content to. And our very first meteorologist was from Columbia, South Carolina. Um, so there are meteorologists out there who feel a true responsibility to talk about this. So we're, we're, we're trying to make headway in that space, because I, I totally agree with you that if you, don't, if you don't hear about this issue at the local level, it doesn't touch you. Um, so I want to uh, show you a little bit of, of some media analysis that we've been doing of extreme weather coverage, uh, and then finally tell you about this new initiative that we've launched, um, because I've been kind of having a midlife crisis about this. It's not the first one. Um, so this is uh, actually the cover of a special issue um, of the Bulletin of the American Meteorological Society. And it, it's specifically looking at extreme weather events. And I think you know, one of the things that, that I saw um, as I was looking at extreme weather coverage is that 
reporters and, and politicians really began to repeat this mantra that we can't attribute an in, any individual event to climate change. I'm sure you've heard it um, right about the time when the science had moved on. Uh, and, and so I think there's, there's a narrative out there that, that needs to be corrected. Um, and, and that's part of what we've been trying to do. And just some you know, examples. Back in 2005, as scientists, we were saying, you know, look, we, we can't attribute an individual event to climate change. But by 2011, the scientific community had moved on. And even in this, this special report from BAMS, it shows, look, it's often been stated that it's simply not possible to make an attribution statement about an individual event. However, scientific thinking on this issue has evolved and that it really is now possible. And so, you know, like I said, I think anytime you see that, that statement um, in print, it, it's just an example of something that we need to fix because the conversation really has changed. So um, Carrie alluded to this, right? Uh, it's, you know, it's, it's warmer, our, our mean uh, temperature is, is up. Um, and as a result, we expect to see more extreme events. It falls from the physics. As Carrie said, you don't need complex computer models to tell us that we're going to see more extreme heat events or more extreme flood events. We've known that going back to spontaneous in the 1800s. Um, and here's kind of a breakdown of, of, of the things that we expect to see shift. Um, and if you look at the two high confidence areas, when it comes to things like precipitation, heat waves, cold waves, floods, and droughts, we can now look at individual weather events. And you know whether you want to call it an autopsy um, or a fraction of attributable risk calculation, that's kind of what we can do now. We can look at individual events and really look at how climate change is changing the, the likelihood of that event. So you know, when I was at the Weather Channel, I would get this question all the time, you know, what's the difference between climate and weather? And you know, so many of us now just quote Mark Twain and we say, you know, Weather is what you expect. I mean, weather is what you get. Climate is what you expect. Um, and you know, I think really what we're seeing now is that climate is what we affect, and the weather is what gets us. Uh, and and I think you know this is the very first paper that was written on extreme events, um, and and it really laid out this framework for how to do it. And you know, it borrows from the statistics of epidemiology, and and just like you can do an autopsy on a body to look at to what extent cigarette smoking increased the likelihood of lung cancer, we can look at an individual event and assess how burning fossil fuels, how additional greenhouse gases increase the likelihood of that particular class of extreme events. The very first paper that was published, Carrie alluded to this as well, was back in, in 2004, and it looked back at the European heat wave of 2003. And you know, it's funny because I was at the Weather Channel, I guess, I started that summer and the European heat wave hit and you know, and and when you cover extreme weather, you know, figuring out when to bring your global warming expert on can be very, very tricky, right? Because you you really, you know, in the midst of, of just human tragedy and devastation, you know, talking about climate change can be, you know, it can, it can be a little a little just off putting, right? It's it's just the timing is not right. And and so figuring out when to bring me on um, in the chaos, as Miles alluded to, was always kind of tricky. And, and then, you know, what, what could I say in the aftermath of a Katrina or a heat wave, you know, when upwards of 30,000 people had died? And it was always just this really kind of tricky thing because, you know, my, my, my anchors would be like, Cullen, you better say something useful. Like, we don't want just another one of these, you know, generalities. And when this paper came out, I kind of felt like I finally had something specific to say. And so what this paper really did was looked at the extent to which burning fossil fuels, if you really burn, you know, boil it down, increase the likelihood of that summer uh, in, in 2003 in Europe. And basically what you do is you, know, you, run, you run kind of two realities. Um, you, you run a model that includes uh, the burning of fossil fuels and, and deforestation, those additional greenhouse gases. And you run a model that doesn't have us in it, you know, the world with us and the world without us, if you will. And then you look at the statistics of how likely a given event would be in those two worlds. And what they found was that that summer in Europe, um, it was made probably twice as likely due to climate change or possibly four times as likely. And then I think the other interesting thing about this paper, um, and I'll say that you know, for me, as a climate scientist who worked at an operational weather channel, um, was just what I came to understand about the power of a forecast. You know, if you go back to the Galveston hurricane of 1900, deadliest extreme event in human history, right? And the photographs from that Galveston hurricane, 
we didn't know it was coming. We didn't have the tools to tell us that that event was going to hit us. And you know, since 1900, right, here we are, and the technology that we have now, 90% of weather forecasts rely on satellite data. I mean, we can see, you know what, we had the track forecast for, for Sandy four days out, and, you know, and it took this radical left turn, right? So the science has advanced tremendously. And so for me, when, you know, when Kerry puts up this projection for the end of the century, I know that for the general public, it just, you know, it doesn't have the kind of emotional impact that it has for me. But the power of a forecast, you know, that to me is really what the science brings to this discussion, is we understand the physics enough, well enough to predict the future. That's incredibly powerful. Um, and so what this paper did was it didn't just look at the summer of 2003. They also moved the models forward in time. And what they found was that if we do nothing to stop climate change, by 2040, the European heat wave is happening every other summer. And by 2070, the summer of 2003 becomes the average summer, right? So all this discussion we've heard about California entering the new normal, that's what we're talking about. Like, that's what the forecast is. And, you know, we've managed with weather to really have people appreciate what that means. I mean, it's not perfect. You know, we still had over 100 people die during Hurricane Sandy. But we're, you know, we're making such impressive strides. And, and so, you know, when I talk about my midlife crisis, it's this recognition that, that part of what we've done as scientists is we've compartmentalized climate change, right? We've, we can show you past changes and how dramatic they are, and I can point to images of, of civilizations collapsing in the past, um, which to me is very powerful. But it's too distant in, in space. It's too distant in time. And, and even something as radical as the wet bulb temperature exceeding 95 degrees, Celsius, 95 degrees Fahrenheit in the Middle East, you know, basically a forecast where it's too hot to go outside, it still is, is really distant um, for folks. And, and the question is, how do we bring it closer to home? And we bring it closer to home by having local TV meteorologists talk about it you know, within the context of a weather forecast. And that's, that's kind of what this allows us to do. And so really, this graphic is just to say that you know, this is the baseball analogy, right? Um, you, know, you, can, you can look at these two worlds, the worlds with uh, the atmosphere on steroids and, and the world without it. And, and you can learn something really important about what we're doing. Um, but, but at the same time, recognizing that you know, unlike a weather forecast where it's, it's all defense, right? All we can do is prepare. Um, with climate change, the fundamental difference is that it's just one possible reality, right? We've got, you know, the RCP, the projections um, for, for, green, you know, for greenhouse gas, gas pathways, it's really just options for us, right? And so, you know, here I am talking about the danger, but boy, am I really looking forward to talking about the opportunity. So, um, how much time do I have? Oh, I have 10 minutes, excellent, okay. Um, sorry, I'm talking really fast, too, because I've only got 15 minutes, because um, I could talk for so much longer. So. Um, I just want to give you uh, some baselines of where the American public stands right now. You know, and I know there's this huge opportunity for NOVA to talk about this issue. I just wanted to kind of give you a feel for where the public stands. So you know, I, on a certain level, you could say that the good news is that more than half of the US population believes that climate change um, is real and human caused. I mean, Miles, you're right. It's about 60 to 70% of, of Americans think that climate change, that global warming is real, so that the temperatures are increasing. You know, and a little bit more than half think that it's, it's human caused. I guess, I guess that's kind of, I don't know. As a scientist, I think we haven't completely failed. But where we failed um, is in actually connecting it to people's lives. Um, and this is uh, just a statistic from the recent Yale George Mason survey, which basically shows that most people still do not think that global warming will harm them personally, even though we already know that our atmosphere has changed and that individual extreme events are already becoming more likely. Uh, this is just media coverage. Um, so you know, if you are a glass half full kind of person, there's more media coverage now than there was back in 2010. Um, but for the most part, Specific, you know, 90-second packages on climate change are still pretty few and far between. I mean, we're now running up to Paris. The Clean Power Plan was released. Keystone was rejected. Climate change is in the news more, but it's still just a blip. Um, this is just the breakdown by the, net, the, the, network, the network news. And so what we did then was, okay, we looked at climate change coverage, and, and it's, it's not, there's not much of it. But when you look at extreme weather coverage, you know, over 1,300 stories on extreme weather in 2014. How many of them brought in the climate change context? 12, right? So 
that's a huge opportunity to connect the dots, right? And, and so I think for me that that was this recognition that one, there's a narrative out there, you can't attribute an individual event to climate change that needs to be fixed. And two, we're kind of just missing this opportunity to connect and give that context that's needed. Um, so we did a similar analysis, not just for um, broadcast news, but for print, looking at three um, recent extreme events. We looked at the Australian heat wave, if you remember those pictures of, um, of tennis players fallen on the court um, due to heat stress. That was the Australian heat wave of 2013. There was a subsequent one in 2014. We looked at the California drought, and then we looked at the UK floods. Uh, and those were the 12 um, media print outlets that we looked at. And again, really, the takeaway is just that tons of extreme weather coverage, um, but even in print, only about 15% mention climate change. Um, and then within that, only about 5% make an explicit attribution connection. And the interesting thing was that the explicit attribution connections that appear in the media actually tend to be made by political figures, um, and they aren't necessarily grounded in science. They tend to be more um, you know, driven by a certain kind of motivation, depending you know, on, on whether you're the prime minister of, of Australia or, or you know, President Obama, right? So the, so the attribution statements that are being made tend to be politically motivated and not grounded in science. And so for me, that also felt like an opportunity to inject objective information into the discussion. And so what we did was we formed a team. Um, there's a number of groups around the world that, that have developed methodologies that are published in that BAM special issue that I just showed you. The, the most recent issue came out last week. Um, there's a, a group of folks who've developed methodologies um, that that can do extreme event attribution. And really what we found in doing the media analysis was that, okay, the BAM special issue that comes out and looks at the extreme events of the previous year, it's fabulous. But by that point, the conversation is over. And you know, David Crowley did a beautiful analysis of the Australian heat wave in the most recent BAMS issue that showed that you know, basically that event was virtually impossible without climate change. But it happened last year, and so no one's writing about it anymore, right? So, so we have to recognize that peer review is critical. You know, having these, these methodologies peer reviewed is critical. But we're at a point now, especially with heat events, where, where we can do them quite quickly, um, and, and we can actually begin to have the conversation that's currently missing. Um, so this is our team. Uh, Climate Central really is just the coordinator um, and, and the facilitator. We develop the graphics. We work with the, the media. And we, we share the information with uh, local TV meteorologists and, and weathercasters from around the world, in fact. Uh, and then we work with, with folks at, at Oxford University. Um, that, that first paper was, in fact, co-authored by uh, the team at Oxford. They use a model called Weather at Home, which is actually distributed computing, so anyone can download the model. Um, and, and run it on the background of their home computer. And the fact that so many people can do this, true citizen science, it allows us to generate really good statistics um, because you want as many iterations as you can possibly get. Uh, KNMI uh, does the observational analyses, and then uh, the University of Melbourne uses the, uh, the IPCC, what's called the CMIP-5 model, so, so basically global coupled climate models. And then we work with our partners uh, in the disaster relief space, the Red Cross Red Crescent Climate Center, because these guys are the ones who are on the front line. So when an extreme weather event happens, um, they're the ones who are getting the calls, whether it's, you know, whether it's from the media or from decision makers and stakeholders who simply want to know what this means, right? So you can, you can do uh, an analysis quickly, but then you can also talk about what this means for the long term, right? Because the goal is to build back better. You know, the opportunity, if you will, is to build back better, to build in resilience, and to recognize that any, anything that we do today to make ourselves more resilient helps us today as well. And, and we can see that we're not perfect um, at, at dealing with these extremes. So really, um, there's, there's four possible answers. Global warming increased the likelihood of an event. Global warming decreased the likelihood of an event. Um, in fact, uh, the epic um, cold that, that the Northeast was hit by, uh, I believe that that was actually analyzed in, there was a, a paper on that in the recent BAMS issue. And um, needless to say, the, the likelihood of that is actually decreasing as we move forward in time. Um, and you know, that said, we still expect to see 
cold, cold air outbreaks, but um, they will become fewer and far between. Um, global warming had no detectable role, and, and then our, you know, our methods were unable to give information. And I'll say that, that I feel like there's, there's some really important communication that needs to be done around that. And, and you know, it's kind of this, this spectrum of to what extent did climate change play a role in an individual extreme? You know, our, our atmosphere is fundamentally different than it was 50 years ago. So climate change, you know, is, is playing out in, in all the weather that we see, but it's just a question of how big of an influence was it and how did it affect the risk? Because what we really care about is how the risk is changing. We can talk more about that. So just wanted to give you one example. Um, our team has, has you know, we've been more or less practicing to really make sure that our methodologies are strong, that we can we can do this quickly, uh, and we can we can generate um, the just the, the distribution arm of this as well that, that needs to be in place. Um, so we've looked at events like the the, the drought in southeast Brazil. Um, we've looked at uh, the India in heat wave, uh, the Indian heat wave last summer, and then this summer over the Fourth of July weekend. There happened to be um, a pretty bad heat wave that, that, that hit across Europe. And so um, I've come to recognize that a lot of extreme events actually happen on the weekend now that we have this team that actually tries to do that very quickly. So of course, on 4th of July weekend, we, we saw that there was a heat wave coming. Um, and what we decided to do was actually try to do a true real-time experiment. Um, and so the teams got together, um, and we, we looked at the observational data. We looked at the models. Um, and so for we did basically two types of an analysis. We, we looked at the region, um, and we used, because extreme event attribution, what's really critical is how the event is defined. And so we defined that heat wave as, as three-day maximum temperature. Um, and what we found was that this event over this entire region was twice as likely um, as a result of burning fossil fuels. And then we actually were able to drill down, because that's the other really interesting thing about bringing this home, if you will. We, we were able to look at, at individual cities. Um, and, and what's critical in terms of doing this right is having the highest quality observational data. And, and doing that quickly is, is hard. But because we had some partnerships with European med agencies, we were able to get that data fairly quickly. Uh, and what we found was that in the case of, of Zurich, for example, um, the three-day period that happened from July 4th to 6th, 6th is now roughly eight times more likely than it was in 1900. And, and if you talk about this, and, and Carrie showed some of these plots in terms of return time periods, that the return time is now roughly every 13 years. Whereas um, you know, in, in 1900, this was, this was technically a, a one in 100 year event. Um, and, and this is kind of a, a very scientific way of saying it. But I think the importance is to inject that into the discussion of heat waves. Um, and, and to tie it to solutions and, and the opportunities that exist as well. I mean, I think it's, it's really kind of attempting to create this new narrative, right? And I think the, the, the solutions need to be part of that narrative. Um, and so really, this is just to say that, that we launched that effort. We released the analysis. Um, our partners at the Red Cross Red Crescent issued a press release. And, um, and, and we, we shared that message uh, to the extent that we were able to with, with, um, with our meteorologists uh, in Europe. And this was just a, a story that, that was written up in, in Nature, um, which I guess the part that I kind of like is that they actually said that this may be the first real-time example of weather attribution. Um, they said maybe because they weren't sure. Um, but it was. It was. It truly was the first time that a group uh, had turned around an extreme event attribution analysis you know, over, over a weekend. Um, and then I'm going to end, because I've got one second, with one other idea. And that is the concept of lock-in. Um, and, and really, uh, it, it, this is uh, Carrie, uh, or actually Miles, mentioned that we released uh, our sea level rise analysis, which, which provides um, imagery from around the world of, of what these choices entail. And this, is, this just happens to be for, for Washington, DC, um, under, under two scenarios. And really, it's just to say that we're making commitments right now to a future. And that's the tricky thing about climate change, right? Is that you have to actually admit that this is correct, right? That, that this projection um, for the future will indeed happen if I don't do anything differently. And what it really shows you is that if, if, we, um, if we follow a pathway that, that, that seizes the opportunities, invests in renewables, um, you know, we are committing to a, a, a much safer, better, healthier, healthier future. Whereas if we just go along business as usual, we're really locking in 
you know, upwards, you know, in this scenario, the, the time frame is, is distant, but it's, it's 23 feet of sea level rise that you're essentially committing to because of the long lifespan of greenhouse gases. So this, this concept of lock-in, I think, is, is really important. And I will end it there. One quick question on the... Um I've played with that, uh, the online, the, the map thing. It's kind of cool. Um, and, you know, we, uh, you talk about ABC, CBS, NBC. This is, to me, a much more effective way to communicate what you've been talking about. And what kind of traffic do you get uh, on that site? Are, are, do people go and, and play with it yeah. a lot? It, the, the traffic is, is actually huge. Um, and what we really try to do is we, you know, we acknowledge that not everyone knows about Climate Central and is going to go directly to our website. It's so, so, so much of, a, of it is about having media partnerships and sharing that tool and the, the, the graphics with, um, with our distribution partners just so that the, the reach is wider. Um, I haven't actually got all of the traffic numbers in yet, but the last, the last release we did just for the U.S. was I want to say upwards of, of a million page views for our site, which for a little climate nonprofit is, is pretty big. Yeah, I mean, it, it's a very interactive way of bringing it to your home. I mean, when, yeah. when you first got Google Earth, what would you do? You look at, look at your own house, yeah. right? So you can yeah. look at your own city and see how much trouble you're in. Exactly, and that, that was the point yeah. of this, right, is that, that you, know, you use weather.com to type in your zip code and get the weather, mm -hmm. and this was you know, to look at something that's like the lifetime of, of a mortgage, if you will, and see the risk. Yeah. All right, for more on that later. Our next guest uh, uses uh, NASA satellites to look at a very strange, mysterious planet, Earth. Waleed Abdullahi is here, and he's going to tell us a little bit about um, his research on glaciers and ice. Good to have you with us, Waleed. Thank you. So what I want to talk about today is what I call the power of perspective. I look at the Earth from space. And when you look at the Earth from space, you understand it in a very different way. And I want to start with a little story about myself. When I was five years old, uh, Apollo 11 landed on the moon. And I, like many other kids, was fascinated by this, this story, this, this phenomenon. And my best friend, uh, Matt Perry, and I used to pretend we were the Apollo 11 astronauts. We'd go to Matt's house. We'd drink Tang in his kitchen. We would get our football helmets, right, put them under our arms, and walk in slow motion, just like we saw on TV, you know, point to the crowd, wave, out to Matt's shed. We'd get in his shed, we'd say goodbye to our parents, shut the door, and um, bang around, right? We'd, we'd throw ourselves against the side of the shed and, and you know, rock it and make noise as we were flying through space, and we would land on the moon, right, right there in Matt Perry's backyard. And we'd open the door, and we'd step out, and there we were on this amazing lunar landscape. And this is a, this is a true story. Every now and then, well, well, it was Matt's shed, Matt's tang, Matt's yard. Matt got to be Neil Armstrong. That's just how it worked. And I got, to, I got to be Buzz Aldrin, which was awesome. But every now and then, this is true. Kids are mean. Um, there was a third kid, I won't say his name, who would join us, and we let him be Michael Collins. And we would never let him out of the shed. He had, to, <laughs> he had to stay in there, and we would tell him all about it when we got back. <laughs> but NASA did something else that really profoundly impacted me uh, every bit as much. They showed us this view of the Earth, Christmas Eve, 1968, Apollo 8. Um, and this is what I mean by the power of perspective. This view changed the way we as a world looked at ourselves. And this is what I want to talk about today, is the value of that perspective. Many of you, all of you, I'm sure, have seen this Earth from night kind of imagery. But there's a story in here, in all the lights, a story about energy, a story about transportation, a story about use uh, of power. Um, there's also a political story. If you look at what appears to be the island in the middle that's light and then dark above it, there's no, oh yes there is, South Korea, North Korea. There's a story in that. Um, if you look, can you start the movie please? If you look at air traffic, um, there's a story about an earth on the move. And a lot of times people well, used to say to me, I just don't see how humans can have an impact on the planet. 
Um, when I look at something like this or the slides before, I don't see how humans cannot have an impact on the planet. And this is really a story about perspective. When you look at things in certain ways, you see them very differently. Um, my own work has been on the, in the Arctic primarily, a little bit in the Antarctic, and I love these places because they're pristine, they're, they're raw, they're nature in its most rugged sense. Uh, they're huge, um, ice, thousands of, well, thousands of kilometers, depending on where you are, in any direction. This is where, this was home for about a month uh, in North Greenland. Uh, kitchen tent, work tent, sleep tents, this guy snored. And <laughs> if I'd taken this picture a few days later, that tent would not be in the picture. We kept moving him further and further away. Uh, but the real question of perspective is how do you change, how do you translate information on scales like this into something meaningful on scales like this? The movie, please. The Arctic sea ice cover, as many of you know, is shrinking, um, but it's a very dynamic um, phenomenon on the Earth's surface. But it's a place far removed from people. People don't see it, people don't feel it. It's this abstract thing that's happening way up there. And we know pretty conclusively that the ice is shrinking. This is a graph of the Arctic minimum, how small it gets in September. And we are well on our way to an ice-free Arctic in the summertime. Well, what does that mean? Yes, yeah, start the movie, please. It's distant, it's far away. But the Earth is a system. When you look at the Earth as a whole, you see that what happens in one place matters in others. So this is just um, an animation of the jet stream, of, of high latitude circulation. And you can see that the wind that affects the low latitudes interacts with phenomena in the Arctic. And as we look at potentially removing the sea ice cover up here, the implications for that could be huge. Right? There, there's one theory that purports that as, as the difference between the equator and the Arctic uh, diminish because the Arctic is warming faster than these other regions, these troughs will, will become more wavy, will deepen. That will have direct impact on how we live, on the phenomena we've been talking about today. Movie, please. Another situation is fires. When we look at the Earth as a whole, and from space we can detect fires, we see the world's on fire. It, it always has been. I mean, these are natural phenomena in the Congo, uh, in the Asian forests, in the Amazon. But the amount of this fire, the intensity, the frequency, is something that we can track with time by observing these from space. And my reason for pointing this out is there is an interconnectedness, just like with the last set of slides, between what's happening on, uh, in remote places and what's happening in our lives. Oops. Um, one area that's experiencing a lot of change, the deforestation in Brazil. This is from the late 1980s, actually I think 1990 and 2010, and I'll just go back and forth. Look at the scale, 40 kilometers down in the bottom left. Huge changes, and this is a major carbon sink in the Earth's carbon budget. Again, it's far away. I don't feel it, I don't see it. But what we don't realize, or most people don't realize, is they do feel it. They may not see it, but they feel the manifestations of change like this. The movie, please. And from fires or from industrial productivity, uh, we have soot, we have black carbon. And I put this up just to show, again, it may originate far away, but if you look at what's going on in Asia, it's making its way across. So what one nation or continent does affects another. I think here there's some good back and forth in the southern hemisphere between Africa and South America, so you do it to me, we'll do it to you kind of thing. But the point here is simply soot, which has implications for climate, has implications for health. There is an interconnectedness here that is essential that we understand. It is not far away. It may originate far away, but it literally gets us where we live. And when you think about how thin the atmosphere is, all of that that I showed you is happening in a very thin veneer of atmosphere. 
That's what sustains life, or this is another perspective. Again, I, I, I talk a lot about perspective. This is why I worked at NASA for so long, because looking at the Earth in this way struck me as very powerful. So all of these phenomena are happening in that thin, thin layer. Actually, a small fraction of that thin, thin layer, if you think about the troposphere where we feel most of these impacts. Um, Again, for perspective, so this is a photograph from the uh, tsunami in Sendai, Japan a few years back. Um, horrible, horrible. I can't imagine being there and seeing this and experiencing this. The loss of life was tremendous. When we look at this in the planetary sense, we see something um, powerful on a different level. Uh, certainly, you can't argue that previous image. This, Incidentally, is the airport uh, in Sendai, Japan, getting overrun by the, by the flood. Um, but when we look at this from space, I'm just going to go back and forth between these. You see that the water encroached several miles inland, um, but ulti sorry, ultimately it was close to 100 miles of inundated land. That is 100 square miles, excuse me. That is a lot of people. That is a lot of land. That is a major, powerful phenomenon. Now, this is a geolog. The tsunami is more geological, although sea level rise does have implications. But the point here is simply perspective tells a very, very powerful story. Um, El Nino. Uh, we are in a what appears to be shaping up to be a very strong El Nino year. Um, how do we really understand and appreciate that? Well, this is sea surface height measured from ocean altimetry. So it's anomalies in height. We can look at ocean surface temperature and get a pretty good indication of what's going on. But ocean height is actually the integral of all of the heat as the ocean expands in the vertical direction all the heat that's stored within the ocean column. So we get a much better sense of the energy stored in here from this height. The white is about a 20 centimeter excess anomaly. Uh, the purple is about a 20 centimeter lower anomaly. Um, and we get a sense of the spatial character. How widespread is this excess heat capacity as a result of the El Nino to feed into the forecasts and it really is this perspective, I think, that helps us understand these phenomena much better. Uh, another Lake, um, Lake Powell, if you've ever been there, you can see that you know, where the water used to be, this too is an up close and personal perspective that affects people. But when we look at it from space, this is the area in 1999. Look at the scale, OK? Um, this is the area in 1999, and this is the area in 2010. So you see, look at the edges in particular. You can see the water level lowing, lowering on very large scales, but you also see sediment discharge, a change in the environment, a change in the ecosystem, a change in recreational activities. Whatever you care about, there's something in there, uh, something for you. Um, the movie, please. I like to show this zoom out. Uh, this is the Grand Canyon just because it tells a story. There's one perspective up close, and as you zoom out, I apologize, it's choppy. You realize that's a river in a canyon system in a geological uh, section of the country. And as we zoom out, you get much more of a sense of the significance, or in some ways, maybe the insignificance. But when you consider that this is a global occurring, globally occurring phenomenon, the significance of these changes. Perspective really shapes the way we perceive things. Uh, there is another kind of perspective. I, I have the benefit of working on ice, both looking at it from space and large spatial scales. But also, I work with people who analyze the ice core and bring in a temporal perspective. And if you look at where we are now, um, let's see. This is, uh, sorry, that's accumulation temperature. Um, when the Vikings settled Greenland, it was actually green. Uh, it wasn't a trick to keep people away, you know, get people to stay away from Iceland. It was green. 
because it was warm. Around 1000 AD, it was warm. The land was mossy, covered with, with uh, short grasses. And then we entered um, the Little Ice Age. Right? And the Vikings did not adopt the native practices of hunting for their food. They tried to have a little more of an agra agrarian society. And when the mini Little Ice Age came, as a friend of mine puts it, they ate their dogs and went home. They couldn't hack it. it. It forced them off an island, out of a habitat. There's a lesson in there. But if we go back a little further, think about that. This little change removed Vikings, of all people. You know, they're not slouches uh, from their habitat. Imagine what changes of this scale, which are in our recent past, geologically speaking, could mean. Or if we go back uh, 400,000 years, we can see um, temperature in red, carbon dioxide in blue, and we can see that the Earth has gone through these swings where CO2 actually in these cases has followed the perturbation of temperature change. The warming of the Earth has released the carbon dioxide. We're in a place now where carbon dioxide is now the forcer, right? And if you look at the historic levels of CO2, we're up at 400 parts per million. We're blowing it out of the water. Okay. Big difference. So the temporal perspective, in my view, is every bit as powerful as the spatial perspective. Uh, can you, I think this is a movie. No, it's not a movie. Not sure why I put this up. Oh, I know why I put this up. Um, so I look at the Earth in this way. And I was struck. You know, I thought I had discovered something amazing. Wow, when you look at the Earth like this, it's cool, it's fascinating, it's powerful. Um, there is a quote that I love. Man must rise above the Earth to the top of the atmosphere and beyond, for only thus will he fully understand the world in which he lives. It's good stuff, right? Socrates, 400 BC, way ahead of me. It took me much longer to learn that than it took him. Um, and, and I want to drive home, whether it's temporal perspective, whether it's spatial perspective from Earth, or whether it is, it is um, the perspective of being up close and feeling it. Depending on how we look at, or the way we look at things, shapes our perception of them. Now, I want to leave you, since I have two and a half minutes with a movie, don't start it just yet. Uh, when I was chief scientist at NASA, we had a competition for an Earth Day video. And this one blew me away. And I think it's worth using the remaining time to watch it, because it's a, it's a human perspective on all the things I just talked about. So if you could go to the next, next slide, sorry, and then the movie. Oh, I'll go to the next. Yeah, just play it. Just enjoy, this is beautiful. From this distant vantage point, the Earth might not seem of any particular interest. The most well known of Carl Sagan's thoughts on our planet starts with these words. Following on from his description of turning the Voyager craft around to take one last picture of our tiny world from roughly four billion miles away. For us, for us, it's different. Here on planet Earth, for many millions of years, we have stared at the sky, curious about the pale points of light we saw shining high above us and what they meant for us and for our place in the enveloping darkness of the cosmos. With trial and error and thought and reflection, we have come to develop an understanding of our solar system, of our galaxy, and of the universe. And yet, so far, there is nowhere quite like our little world. There are worlds and balls of rock that are too cold and barren to sustain us, others too hot, some with toxic atmospheres, some with atmospheres that would easily crush us and yet others with no atmosphere at all. Even as we venture forth, hoping to find some sign that we are not alone in this universe, 
still it seems that there is no one listening to our young and curious species as we call out in the endless night of space. Many of us may never see our whole planet from orbit, from the moon, or from any other planet with our own eyes, treading the inky black sea of space, awash in a pale blue glow of reflected light from our sun. Yet this same planet, this moat of dust, captures us in its sway, its beauty inspiring us, reminding us of what goes unexplored on our own tiny world and of our unity as a species. All of us born on the same point of light that we call home. So next time you do this, you may want to invite Fiona, because <laughs> I think I, I was blown away when I saw it. She won, by the way. She won the contest. So thank you. Why don't you get our other two uh, speakers up on the stage? And, uh, well, Lead, I'm uh, curious. You say that, uh, so go ahead and sit down, make yourself comfortable. You're, you're, you say that uh, human beings have this tremendous ability to impact the planet. What, what do you think about some of the ideas about uh, geoengineering? Oh, wow. Um, I was on a, a National Research Council uh, committee on, we call it climate intervention, because geoengineering implies more precision than we actually have. So um, we need an intervention. Yeah, I'm, I'm an intervention. Serious. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's got potential. It's no solution. It's got potential. Uh, we, uh, we refer to, in the case of a climate emergency, for example, where the result of non-intervention looks like it might be worse than the result of intervention. But boy, when you get to the point of making that choice, you're, you're really in a mess if that's your alternative. Um, it's worth researching, it's worth understanding, because who knows, we may get to that point. But uh, it is far, far more prudent to ensure we don't get to a place like that. Now, you, you spend a lot of time looking at uh, ice, sea ice, mm -hmm. and glaciers. Yep. And uh, I've heard it said many times, correct me if I'm wrong, that, that and see if you uh, ascribe to this, that the, the impact of you know, an ice sheet dropping into the ocean is not really reflected in the climate models that we have, that, 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 that scientists have been so conservative about going there, that these fee when these feedback loops really start coming into play, the sea level rise might be much worse than we expected. Is that true? Yes, that is true. That, you know, there's a probability distribution and there's a tail to that distribution that we don't really understand. You know, some people look at the last time the Earth was this hot, <coughs> the oceans were six meters higher than they are today. Um, but glaciologically, if we look at the mechanisms and how long it takes these things to happen, there's a lot we don't understand. There's some wild cards in the system. So. You know, when you're making a scientific assessment, as the IPCC does, you acknowledge the tales of the distribution. But until we have a little more confidence than we do have, it's, it's out there as a possible future. Carrie mentioned a meter being within reason. That's, that's you know, we're comfortable, for lack of a better term, uh, with that as an estimate. But there is a very real possibility that it will be much worse. Uh, there is a possibility it won't be as bad, but the worse end of the spectrum is, goes out much further than the, the better end of that spectrum. So, Kerry, I remember when I interviewed you a few years ago for the, um, the, that epic uh, Nova Megastorm Aftermath, uh, which uh, I invite you all to watch. Um, <laughs> had a little something to do with that one. It, um, you were talking, uh, it was interesting to me, we were talking about how um, we as human beings, because of our limited time scale, don't appreciate that we, we basically, humankind has kind of evolved in a period of, of relative climate stability. And we built a civilization that, you know, is right to, the, right to the envelope, pushing the envelope of that stability. And we're not ready to handle the instability which we're creating for ourselves. 
I mean, do you, are you at all, opti and we we're, want we're to talk about opportunities here, if you can find them. Are you at all uh, optimistic, or do you see opportunities there for us to retool our civilization to, to deal with what seems to be inevitable? Absolutely. I'm very optimistic about that. I think that uh, the technology, coupled with the final recognition that we have to do something about it, are going to offer enormous uh, opportunities for us to deal with this problem. I think we should all be optimistic. I also think that, <clears throat> that the reason that a certain number of people, <clears throat> excuse me, as, as Heidi showed us, still don't believe this, is more because they fear the solutions than that they're not ready to accept the problem. Their denial of science is, is a cover for the fact that they really are afraid of the solutions. Rather than being afraid of them, I think we should embrace them. Sooner or later, we have to transform our energy technology. And uh, climate change makes it imperative that we do that sooner. But we can do it. We have all kinds of exciting technology that allows us to generate electricity cleanly. We have renewables. We have next generation nuclear fission, which is much better than the current generation, we, we are beginning to master ways of pulling carbon out of the atmosphere. If we don't do it, uh, other nations will. And they may not do it in ways that we, that we appreciate. So we really, it, it's an opportunity, it's also an imperative. It's, yeah. It hasn't been presented that way very well, and, and uh, forces that, that might view it as um, a disadvantage to them have been very successful in, in sort of controlling the debate. Um, right. And I, I think it's, um, you know, with all due respect to scientists, it, they're up against um, a marketing campaign they really can't match if they want to be true to their science, right? So how do you, how do you thread that needle between being true to the science and, and always offering the uncertainty, which scientists is a part of their lives, versus somebody who, who might be more of a PR, uh, from a PR background and is not concerned about such details? Well, I have to admit that in all of my grant writing, I've never put a line item saying marketing in one of my <laughs> science proposals. And nobody, nobody in my profession. Maybe it's would. time. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's right. But, you know, I think scientists are valuable because its marketing is antithetical to our culture. And once we start advocating for anything, we lose that objectivity. I think what is changing is that I think society recognizes that value, and they're increasingly people are able to tell the difference between a tobacco company that says, don't worry about cigarettes, and a scientist that says, you really ought to worry about cigarettes. They, maybe there's a lot more money behind the former than the latter, but people are smart enough in the end to tell the difference. At least I have the faith that they are. Well, I'm convinced that in the end that is true. It's just, it mm -hmm. takes time, and I wonder how much time we have is the question. Um, so Heidi, um, why do you think, I have some theories myself, but I want to hear your theories on why so few of those wild weather stories on the networks make any reference at all whatsoever to climate? You know, my sense is that right now, folks don't know that we can make that connection, right? So I think first there's... Well, he, he can. He's good. He, there, <laughs> well, there, are, there are folks. And that's, yeah. I think that's you can do where <laughs> we need to build yeah. bridges between the weather and the climate science communities. Because I think actually one of the things that happened was, you know, that as part of this conversation, those bridges kind of broke down between the meteorologists and the climatologists. And I, I do think that, that having this perspective, this temporal perspective where, you know, we're looking at this vast time scale um, and, and making that connection is really critical. So I think Part of it is that the science is only beginning allow it to allow us to make objective statements that, that connect an extreme weather event to climate change. Um, and also, our communities need to talk to each other more. Yeah, why can't we all get along here, right? We need to. Uh, we let's, need to. Uh, there you were, right in the middle of it, as a uh, climatologist uh, surrounded by meteorologists. That's and, right. <laughs> and I'm, I'm always amazed, I, I've, you know, dealing with uh, meteorologists in, in my world over the years at CNN and other places, how many of them were uh, hardcore climate skeptics. Why is that? So I think the, what, the way we looked at it was that meteorologists actually looked more like the general public than they did like climate scientists in their, in their acknowledgement of, of the science of climate change. Um, and I, so we've done surveys, and what we've found is that there's about, you know, 10 percent who are just, just you know, skeptics in that, in that sort of denialist sense of the word that, you know, based on their value system, they do not um, agree with the science of climate change. Uh, and and it, it would be probably very difficult to convince them otherwise. 
But what we found was that about two thirds of meteorologists felt like they had a responsibility to talk about it, but they didn't actually know what to say. And so building bridges between the two communities, I think, was really important. That's part of what we've been trying to do. And you know, a lot of, of meteorologists actually don't get a grounding in climate science. So well, that's that's amazing to me. So you, you can go to Penn State and get your meteorological degree, and you I don't learn think climate. Climatology is, is, that... is an elective. I right. think really? it's an elective. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, wow. no, it's, there's not much overlap. I mean, you can teach people to be very, very good weather forecasters without teaching them radiant transfer. Well, I'm a terrible weather and... forecaster, right? <laughs> well, so like... <laughs> my, my sense of it is, uh, my, the way I've interpreted it over the years, is that meteorologists um, think because of the fact they know how to forecast whether they know climate. And, and they don't necessarily understand the difference, which would be yeah. nice if that was taught along the way right. before they were in, yeah, in front I mean, of the public with that seal of approval. This classic response that we've heard, which is, you know, a, a weather, you can't get the weather right two weeks out, so how can we forecast to the end of the century? And that's where, you know, all of our heads explode for a second, and then we say, okay, this is a really important opportunity to discuss the differences between right. weather forecasting and climate modeling. Well, and, and if I may, the interesting thing is we live our lives in almost everything we do on probability-driven decisions. We decide on insurance, life insurance, health insurance, um, how much we're going to save for college, our planning for retirement, um, a trip we're going to take. I mean, everything we do is probability driven. Yet in this area, probability seems to seems to fall by the wayside. If I can't have certainty, it must be meaningless. Well, human beings are not very good at yeah. assessing risk, right? Yeah. Generally, we, we're, we're afraid of getting on an airplane, and that's and, and yet we blithely drive down the interstate. Right where we're more likely to get creamed. So uh, um, anybody have questions uh, from the audience? If so, we got one down here. And uh, we'll, uh, we have just a few more minutes left. This is more like a, like a point on the question of uh, advocacy by scientists. Can you all hear him? Is it, is it on? Yeah. OK, great. Sorry. I, I think uh, quite to the contrary that I believe scientists climate change scientists and others have an ethical responsibility to advocate survival behavior. And I see this kind of cartoon of the world running off the cliff and watching it are two climate scientists who say to each other, well, at least we never advocated. <laughs> <laughs> well, I suppose I'd better uh, answer that one, Jeremy, since I'm the guilty party <laughs> I here. I think that's you. Uh, I think it it revolves around the, probably the definition of what we mean by advocacy. I would agree with you that at the very least, we ought to be, we have to be strong advocates for science, for doing science. This is taking on real meaning. For example, as you're probably aware, there are congressmen today who have specifically gone after, on a line item basis, funding for climate by the federal government. They've singled it out for cuts. And we have to stand up and say, what are you doing? You know, this is crazy. This is the one thing you really ought to be funding. Whatever you feel about climate projections, we've got to know the system better. We have to advocate for that, absolutely. And we have to also publicize what we do. It gets a little bit trickier when we are asked, as I have been, and probably some of my colleagues have been asked to be, you know, kind of paper over the uncertainties. Don't talk about that because it, you know, people will, will go for the fact that since we don't know it, we shouldn't do anything about it. That, that gets to be a, you know, a much tougher judgment. It's something that, we, that deserves a lot more discussion, this whole business of where we draw the line on advocacy. Well, you know, the scientist who comes to mind here as I hear that question is Jim Hansen, who, uh, of course, moved from running the Goddard Center in Manhattan into a much more of an advocate's kind of role, getting himself arrested at the White House and so forth. And we're not casting any pejoratives to Dr. Hansen at all, I, all of, a friend of all of ours. But do you think, generally, should scientists be moving into that realm, being more? Do you want to get arrested? I mean, should you? I mean, that kind of thing. Well, I think that there's, I think this is a very personal decision. And I remember that um, I was on a panel at MIT about what we could do about climate change. And the students asked the panel, uh, what can we as students do. And I guess I, 
I think the problem was I was grouchy at the point because my other panelists were all economists who were weighing, <laughs> you know, looking at this in strictly economic terms. So I said to the students, the first thing you should do is get mad because, you know, my generation is handing your generation, what I should have said is they should get engaged. But I thought anger was a good route to that. <laughs> and MIT has never let me forget that I said that to the <laughs> students. Because they went on the divestment war path and they've been called, they're camped out in front of our president's office to this day. It's all your and fault. And so Raphael Wright <laughs> looks at me and says, aren't you the guy that started that? <laughs> yeah, at which careful. time you say, thank God for tenure. <laughs> right, yeah. All right, so, yes, <laughs> Paula. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Um, this is about attribution, because we are told constantly that you can't attribute any single uh, weather event to climate change, and not by politicians or by other reporters, but actually by scientists. So what's the deal? Has the word not spread about this new methodology? Yeah, I mean, my, my sense, and, and I, I think that's right, that we, you know, even within our scientific community, when the phone rings and an extreme event is happening and, and you kind of get that question where you know that the reporter's trying to take you down this road where you're like, oh yeah, that was climate change, there can be this tendency to be like, I need to say something that, that brings us back into this more objective space. And so I'd say that the extreme event attribution community is, is small, it's within the broader climate change community. And you know that, that quote from the special report, um, makes it sound like the broader climate science community knows how far along extreme event attribution has come, um, but it doesn't. And so I think that, that sometimes we will still see scientists just saying that um, to, to kind of play it safe. And, and, I, and, and it's just, it's no longer a correct statement. But you, you still have the, if, if asked, could this have happened without climate change? The answer is yes, it could have but it would have been, it's far less likely that it would have. And that's, that's the gray area there because it's, you can't quite point and say this because, you can say this far more likely because, but then you get into a conversation that, you know, to be fair to your people, Miles, the soundbite chasers just have trouble with. <laughs> Right. Ouch. <laughs> Not you. Uh, You've yeah, always yeah. been very good. But, but you know you know there are I people I know these out people. Yes. They can't yeah. be trusted. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, I think we're going to have to take a break for about 20 minutes now. And uh, obviously, uh, everybody's sticking around a little bit, right? If you have any yeah, further questions. Sure. And I have a feeling they might answer them. So we'll see you back at 11. Thank you.